Hello, this is Dennis Polis. Welcome to another in the series of Open Philosophy videos. This video will be discussing the laws of nature in relation to causality. Last time we discussed the laws of nature with regard to their universality and I made the point that the scientific method is inapplicable to the problem of mind because the scientific method is designed to filter out subjective elements and focus on what is objective while the mind is the center of our subjectivity. This does not mean that the laws of nature do not apply to mind. In fact, if we define the laws of nature to be that which determines the flow of action, then clearly what we think is a result of the laws of nature. The question is whether laws so defined are universal or particular. We shall discuss that in a future video. Some of my correspondents have claimed that the laws of nature don't do anything. I think that they're confusing the laws of nature with the laws of physics. The laws of physics describe what goes on in nature, and of course descriptions don't do anything in nature, but the thing that they describe that does something. We know that the laws of nature do something because of our analysis of knowing. We found that knowing was the result of a subject-object interaction. Unless the laws of nature can interact with us, we will never know them, and they can't interact unless they do act. So, for us to know the laws of nature, they must be able to act directly or indirectly on us. On the face of it, it's silly to ask whether something which does something, which acts, is a cause. Yet, because of confusion in modern philosophy about what a cause is, we need to consider this question seriously. When modern philosophers discuss causation, they have in mind a concept which is brought to the fore by David Hume and elaborated on by Immanuel Kant. This idea of causation involves two events separated in time but following each other according to some rule, so that the first event may be said to cause the second. An example of this is playing pool, where hitting the cue ball results in one of the other balls going into a pocket. This, however, is not how the laws of nature work. The law of gravity, for example, does not work first and then things fall second. Rather, it works continuously during the entire process of falling. Imagine how strange it would be if the law of gravity worked up to a certain point in time, then stopped for a while, and then, later, resumed its operation. What kind of causality is this? To find the answer, we need to go back to Aristotle. Aristotle saw that there were two kinds of efficient causality. One was the kind that we've seen in Hume and Kant's analysis of causality, in which an earlier event seems to cause a later event. The other is very different. The example Aristotle asks us to consider is a builder building a house. Clearly there is a cause, the builder building, and there is an effect, the house being built. But the two are not separate events. Rather, the builder building the house is identically the same event as the house being built by the builder. Thus, there is only one event in this kind of causality. This is called essential causality. And this is how the laws of nature work as causes, by essential causality. Gravity accelerating two bodies toward each other is the same as two bodies being accelerated toward each other by gravity. There is one event not two separate events as in Humean Kantian or accidental causality. In this type of causality, there is an essential connection between the cause and effect. They are necessarily related. Aristotle saw that in this case, causes and effects are inseparable. Every happening is a doing, and every doing is a happening. Energy being conserved by the conservation law is identically the conservation law conserving energy. Thus, the way in which the laws of nature operate, the kind of causality they have, is not what human can't thought, but is essential causality, as was realized long ago by Aristotle. Mm -hmm.